Good evening, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's lecture by Dr. Angelos Hajigumis, a Cypriot zooarchaeologist with extensive research, not only on Cyprus, but also Iberia, the British Isles, and the Middle East. Angelo studied archaeology at the University of Athens and then moved on to the University of Sheffield, the mecca for environmental archaeology, to pursue an MSc in environmental archaeology and paleoeconomy. He then did a PhD in zooarchaeology in the same university, which he completed in 2010. His doctoral research focused on animal domestication in Iberia and contributed new knowledge on central archaeological questions relevant to the establishment and evolution of productive economies, and more generally, the interaction between human and animal populations. After his PhD, Angelos received several fellowships, including one from the Fitch Laboratory in Athens, to pursue postdoctoral research on material from various sites in Greece, Cyprus, and Iraq. In 2012, he won a highly prestigious Marie Curie Individual Fellowship to work at the National Museum of Natural History in Paris in collaboration with Dr. Jean Denis Vigne. And the topic of his project there was sheep and goat management in Cyprus from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age, an archaeozoological, isotopic, and ethnographic approach. After Paris, he moved to Groningen, where he taught zooarchaeology for a semester before moving back to the UK initially to work for a commercial archaeology unit based in Oxford, and eventually to return to his alma mater, the University of Sheffield, where he is currently working as a research technician and demonstrator in zooarchaeology. As I noted in the beginning, Angelos has worked all over the Mediterranean and has acquired an important set of skills for the interdisciplinary study of animal remains, including isotopic and dental microwear analysis. He has a long list of publications, which include several articles in journals and edited volumes or excavation monographs, and has co-edited and has co-edited a volume entitled "The Dynamics of Neolithization in Europe: Studies in Honor of Andrew Sherat." It is a pleasure to have him back here in the ARU, and I, like I'm sure all of you, look forward to his lecture entitled. Flesh on Bones, Latest Developments and State of Affairs in Cypriot Zoo Archaeology. Thank you very much, Lina, for the flattering introduction. It's always a pleasure to be at the Archaeological Research Unit among so many familiar um, faces, colleagues, and friends. Um, as the title suggests, today there is a lot on the menu. I will start with a quick overview of uh, zooarchaeological research in Cyprus so far, and then I will continue to the main course of the talk, which uh, is a three-part course, essentially, of uh, consisting of three case studies from my own research in the last two years. And I will conclude with uh, the future, future prospects of uh, zooarchaeological research in Cyprus. Starting with a very brief uh, overview of the archaeological research in Cyprus, just as a background, the first interaction, the first study of animal remains in Cyprus, scientific study, was a paleontological one by Dorothea Bate, whose uh, paleontological work in Cyprus many of you might be familiar with. Uh, but Dorothea Bate was also a pioneer in archaeology, even if she hasn't uh, even if she didn't work as a zooarchaeologist in Cyprus, uh, it's worth mentioning. In Cyprus, most of her work was focused on the dwarf elephant of Cyprus, which she identified as a species and characterized, thus putting Cyprus on the paleontological map uh, of the world. In terms of archaeological animal remains, starting with the early excavations in the late 19th and early 20th century, if we can call them excavations in the modern sense of the word, especially in uh, Bronze Age tombs. Uh, several of these excavators reported animal remains full stop. In the 1920s, we had the first study by a zoologist, Hans Wallengreen of the University of Lund, who studied some uh, uh, animal remains from tombs of Lapithos. In the 1950, we had the first systematic study of bones from uh, uh, Bella Bais Venus Cemetery by another zoologist, H.G. Stubbings. 
and the first settlement, the faunal remains from a settlement uh, were studied by Gerstadt from Petra Dulimnidi and they were partly reported intermittently. Zoarchaeology proper became a fully fledged science uh, with international recognition in the 1960s and 70s and prehistoric Cyprus was the perfect playground and I use the word playground in the best sense of the, of the word in this case uh, for the new zoarchaeologists to uh, exercise the new um, science. In the 70s and 90s, we see the first scientifically modern and sound archaeological studies carried out in Cyprus. And the results have been so positive that uh, by the end of the 20th century, most uh, archaeological projects in Cyprus included archaeology um, and uh, uh, most, most of the prehistoric uh, projects included archaeology. I have to <laughs> correct that. And uh, we have seen the descent of some of the heavy artillery of archaeology in Cyprus, people such as um, uh, Anthony Legg, who worked in Ayos Epictetus, uh, my colleague in Sheffield, Paul Halstead, who worked in, um, at Kuklia, Simon Davis, you might know him from his work in Hirogitia, the living legend of Paul Croft, that most of you are familiar with, who has done most of the archaeological work in Cyprus. And more recently, Jean de Nevigne that, and other French archaeologists that uh, came to Cyprus with very beneficial uh, results uh, for Cypriot archaeology. Now that I look at them, I think I should grow more facial hair to <laughs> stand better chances of his archaeological career. <laughs> the last 30 years, the work of all these people and many more has uh, made Cyprus from just an interesting place, archaeologically speaking, to uh, brought Cyprus to the forefront of developments. Um, the archaeological work in Cyprus uh, contributed to uh, answering major archaeological questions, not only archaeological questions, such as the earliest animal domestication uh, in Cyprus being an island, uh, processes that could not be easily detected on the mainland, could um, be detected more easily in Cyprus, which acted as a sort of mirror, mirroring the developments on the, uh, on the mainland. Um, issues such as the introduction of fauna, feralization of that fauna, and re subsequent reintroductions were very in, uh, interesting topics uh, researched. Also, game management and animal uh, management was among the foci, and secondary products, the use of secondary products from the Neolithic, the later Neolithic, consumption, uh, and many other topics uh, are currently being researched in the archaeology of Cyprus. And this resulted in a literally an avalanche of, um, of uh, publications relating to Cypriot archaeology, some of which you can see now on the screen, and the last thing that appeared on the screen is the, the big, uh, one of the biggest archaeological conferences that is held in the world called ASWA, Archaeology of Southwest Asia, was held here in Cyprus last June with the collaboration of the CNRS and the uh, University of Cyprus, uh, Cyprus and the Archaeological Research Unit specifically, and the Department of Antiquities and resulted in 80 zoarchaeologists descending uh, on Cyprus to discuss uh, cutting-edge zoarchaeological research. And now we move to the main course of the talk, which is uh, research that I, uh, so case studies from my research of the last few years. Case study number one is uh, stable isotope analysis of oxygen and carbon, only oxygen in this case due to lack of time on sheep and goat sheep from two uh, uh, pre-pottery Neolithic B sites in Cyprus. Uh, they both uh, belong to the 8th millennium and one of them is Kridu Marotu Yorkis from the uplands of Paphos and Pareklishashi Lurogambos from the south coast near Limassol. Before I pre present any results, just to make sure that we are all on the same page concerning isotopes, because not everybody is interested in isotopes, I will give you a very brief crash course on isotopes. All chemical elements have isotopes, 
as the word implies, isos, same or equal, and topos. What is the same between isotopes? Their atomic number. And what is the difference? Their atomic mass. Just to give you a specific example, we have two isotopes of oxygen, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. They have the same atomic number, which is eight for the protons. They couldn't have had less or more, otherwise they wouldn't be oxygen. And what is different is the number of neutrons. Oxygen 16 has eight, plus eight protons gives us an atomic mass of 16, while oxygen 18 has 10 neutrons, plus eight protons gives us an atomic mass of 18. So oxygen 18 is a slightly heavier um, isotope than oxygen 16. The proportions of different stable isotopes, for example, oxygen 16 to oxygen 18, of different uh, chemical elements, it could be carbon, it could be strontium, are affected by environmental conditions, topography, geology, etc. And exactly there lies the opportunity for zoarchaeology uh, to act, for them to act as proxies of different processes uh, relating to dietary changes, environmental conditions, uh, climate change, animal management, and many more. The rationale behind the use of oxygen isotopes that I will be presenting in this case uh, is that the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 in meteoric water precipitation varies seasonally and mainly due to the temperature. Put simply, higher temperatures promote more evaporation of the heavier isotope oxygen 18 Lower temperatures promote, uh, favor the, more, the, he the lighter uh, isotope oxygen-16. So in the case of Cyprus, we would have more oxygen-18 in uh, the summer, water evaporating in the summer, and lower in the winter. Um, then, after water precipitates, Animals ingest this water through drinking and consuming food that contains the same ratios, thus locking inside their heart tissues these signals that reflect the local climate. And how do we unlock that signal? For those of you who have worked in Neolithic sites in Cyprus, you, would know, you, you might find this tooth familiar. It looks as if someone dipped it in cement. <laughs> and uh, we have to, to get to the signal, we have to mechanically remove that uh, cement-like crust in order to reach the enamel of the tooth. And then we sequentially sample it, and the end result is something like that, where each line represents a sample from the apex to the base of a tooth. Uh, then each of these samples goes into the mass spectrometer and the mass spectrometer gives us the ratio between oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. Don't worry, we're not going to use these graphs. The only thing I would like you to notice from these graphs is that they give us a sinusoidal pattern. It's like an S horizontally. And the reason for this is because they reflect cyclical events, such as the, the seasonal changes and fluctuations in, in temperature. And if you remember a couple of slides ago, the higher values represent the hottest part of the year. The lower values represent the coldest part of the year. In the case of Cyprus, summer and winter, respectively. You can see it here a little bit better. And it's important that within each tooth, we catch an entire cycle, which is the equivalent of a year. In order to make to get rid of background noise and also uh, um, remove size differences between animals, we model the results to find the best fit and make the the different samples directly comparable. And finally, the end result is a graph like this one, where we can explore the season of birth, the seasonality of birth, and the season of birth of sheep and goat, and I will explain how. On the, the x-axis, we have values from 0 to 1, which is one cycle 
or one year. As you can see, it's divided in 12 intervals, which represent uh, the 12 months of the year. Problem is, we don't know where the year starts. The year doesn't start at zero. It might start at 0.33 or at one, or anything goes, essentially. Nevertheless, the points there indicate groupings of births within a certain year, and this is important in itself. Even though there is some structure, uh, I should mention first that uh, to the left are the goats of Isiorkis, the middle are the sheep of Isiorkis, and to the right, the sheep of Shilurogambos. There were not enough goats at Shilurogambos, unfortunately. Um, in itself, this pattern is extremely interesting and very important result because for the first time we have evidence that early domesticates were capable of breeding outside the naturally constrained season of birth that wild animals have. So whether they were selected by humans to do that or they just adapted in the new environment in Cyprus, we don't know. But the important thing is that we know that they were capable of doing that in the eighth millennium calibrated BC. This in turn has important repercussions for the spread of Neolithization because in the past several researchers have expressed doubts about the speed with which the Neolithic technologies could spread and diffuse in Europe. At least in terms of sheep and goat, it seems that uh, they can very quickly adapt into new environments and be productive. So if anything held them back, it wasn't the sheep or the goat. The other important question we can answer with this is to attempt to put a season where most of these births took place. And the way we tried to do that was to analyze an animal of known birth date, specifically a sheep that was, excuse me, was born in February and gave us the value indicated by the red line. Based on that, if there was February, then the winter is indicated by the blue rectangles. And if that was winter, the brown rectangle is autumn, which shows that most births took place in autumn and winter, as it was actually the case until very recently in traditional sheep and goat practice, uh, man management in Cyprus. Again, this is important because in the archaeological literature, many people by default consider that spring is a sort of default setting in animals that give birth, animals should give birth in spring. No, animals give birth whenever the time is optimal for the survival of their offspring. And the same logic can be used by herders because it's cheaper to have animals born when there is available food around. And from the sciencey world of isotopes, we move to the more colorful world of ethno ethnography and ethnozarchaeology uh, more specifically. Before I present the results on this one, I would like to mention that ethnography is a relatively well-developed uh, uh, discipline in Cyprus. Um, but the point I will make with this case study, and sorry, I, I wanted to mention also some important works of ethnography in Cyprus that have been used in archaeology, uh, for example, a member of the archaeological research unit here, uh, Professor Rizobulu Umenidu, has written a lot about the pastoral life. Uh, also, the work of Pavlos Kshudas is very, very relevant to um, the interactions between humans and, pe and uh, animals in Cyprus. Even the work of geographers, uh, geographers such as Dimitrios uh, Christodoulou uh, in the, for the land use of, uh, in Cyprus are very uh, are invaluable for archaeological research as well. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we can make even more out of this information if this research is conducted by archaeologists or having archaeological questions in mind, because they will we will gain more compatible data with archaeological data, and we can enrich our interpretative framework in archaeology. This case study involved interviews, semi, semi-structured interviews with uh, traditional sheep and goat herders in Cyprus, 23 of them. Uh, and as you can see, there is good coverage of the uh, entire island. <clears throat> I'm 
Among the categories of data collected were, was information, were information about the landscape, the type of terrain that they exercised their profession, distance to the sea and uh, other attributes, the level of mobility of animals, the physical characteristics of the animals themselves, breeding patterns, how many males and females and, uh, and seasonality of breeding, age at death information, the economic rationale behind their choices, uh, whether they kept the herd for uh, meat production or milk production or wool or manure or a combination of these products, and of course consumption. Um, in, uh, you know the archaeologists uh, love age at death data because uh, uh, it gives us a lot of information about the logic of the ancient herder. So I will focus only on this part for this brief uh, presentation. In terms of mortality in the first year for uh, lambs and kids, kids are the babies of goats, <laughs> and uh, there is a clear trend which I have never seen, I have never read a zoarchaeologist referring to this or taking it into account, the fact that lambs grow much faster because of the higher fat content of sheep's milk. Hence, they reach the slaughter weight much earlier than kids, resulting in different age at death for lambs and kids. Two to three months and three to five respectively. Um, and traditionally, herders were slaughtering uh, the lambs and kids at younger ages compared to nowadays in order to maximize their milk production. Nowadays, there are technological solutions to that, so they, they, the herders are independent of this constraint. Concerning lambs specifically, that I had more information for, uh, the optimal slaughter age was two months when they were focusing on milk production, and between six and 12 when they were focusing on meat production, more towards six in more intensive practices and more towards 12 in more uh, extensive uh, practices. Also, interestingly, there were, there were also cultural reasons for, uh, in some cases, to keep animals until uh, later or um, to grow a little bit more. For example, some animals were reserved for fairs of saints to be slaughtered during the fairs of saints or even to be sold to um, other communities such as uh, Muslim Cypriots that would cook with sheep's fat as opposed to Christian Cypriots that would cook with pig's fat. And now we move to the adults, adult sheep the rather self-evident fact that injured, sick, barren, low productivity animals would be slaughtered before the end of their reproductive life. And traditionally, ewes uh, were never slaughtered before uh, um, younger than five years of age and most actually reached 10 to 15, even if the herders stated that their prime years were three to seven. They simply couldn't afford to replace the whole herd between three and seven years, so they had to keep animals longer even if the productivity was uh, reducing. Concerning rams, something that I had no idea about, they said that the older the ram, the better the lambs it produces. So, uh, and that was, uh, I haven't, uh, none of them gave me a different answer. It seems to be a, a common fact for them. And as opposed to uh, opposing the traditional with the recent practices, there is a clear trend, obviously, nowadays for uh, younger, lower age at death, because, simply because they can afford to replace the herd much more regularly, and there are also much more economic pressures to make a profit, at the detriment, usually, of um, the welfare of animals. Very similar situation in, in adult goats uh, concerning the females, but striking the exact opposite situation concerning the bucks. None, no herder kept a, a male goat more than two to three years, and they claimed that the semen quality deteriorates very fast after the second and third year of life. Another mechanical problem is that 
bugs become too heavy to mount the females during reproduction. This is because of uh, more pronounced sexual dimorphism between male and female goats, as opposed to a much more similar body size between sheep, a male and female sheep. Again, the same trend, traditional with uh, recent practices for lower age of death. So, how can we use this information in archaeological interpretation? We can use the differences between sheep and goat, lambs and kids, essentially, in mortality in these early age intervals, zero to six months, and this is a very crucial age interval because that's where it's defined whether a herd is exploited for milk or meat. And knowing if a herd is co consisted more of sheep or goat, we can then interpret accordingly, keeping in mind the fact that lambs and kids have different growth rates. In this way, we can move things to the next level and gain higher resolution in interpreting mortality profiles, which are becoming a little bit boring, I have to say. So we need to take them to the next level. Also, we can take into account this sharp difference between mortality in male goats and uh, male sheep. Even though male animals uh, are a small proportion of herds, it's important if we want to, uh, again, gain a higher resolution to take that into account. Also, um, this is a well-known fact, but it's good to have confirmation also for sheep and goat in Cyprus that mobile and extensive systems of uh, animal management, such as the ones we had in the past, uh, promote slower growth and later, older age at death, as opposed to intensive systems that promote faster growth uh, and animals reach their slaughtering weights uh, earlier. Moving on to the third um, case study, you can suspect from the title that I'm about to complain for the fact that zoarchaeology is not developed at all in the later, in the second half of Cypriot archaeology. Uh, I should say animals are unfortunately still not routinely collected, and um, with the obvious. Um, uh, detriment uh, to archaeological interpretation. But enough with complaining. This is the plan of the Cistercian nunnery of uh, Ayos Theodoros uh, in Nicosia, excavated by the Department of Antiquities and University of Cyprus. And here I would like to thank uh, Michalis Olympios, my colleague and good friend, from, um, for inviting me to study the, the animal remains from this site. The overall aim of this study was to provide a first glimpse into human-animal relationships that developed in this um, very interesting context of a Cistercian nunnery in medieval Cyprus. Cistercian nunneries in general are very rare uh, in uh, Europe as in general on a pan-European level and this is pretty much the only one from the Crusader East. So what a shame it would be if we hadn't studied the material. In order to achieve this general aim, we, um, a, a series of more specific aims should be fulfilled, such as the abundance and role of each animal at the site. To tackle the question of external provision of the nunnery versus on-site production of food, and in general, open up the discussion on uh, novel themes in archaeology, such as the diet at the Cistercian nunnery, uh, economic activities, social status, um, and everything that uh, relates to these themes. Um, this was um, a salvage excavation, so understandably and inevitably, um, there is a recovery bias against the smaller animals, such as small mammals, bird and fish and to reduce the, to constrain the damage of inclusive material, I also excluded all specimens collected from the surface or near the surface. Also, the history of the nunnery provides some sort of safety in, in the 
um, dating because it was founded in the 13th and dismantled in the mid 16th uh, century. So we have this broad but relatively safe bracket, chronological bracket. Due to uh, its recent chronology, the assemblage is in good condition, unlike the Neolithic tooth you saw earlier, uh, allowing a high degree of identifiability. And moving on to the results, this is the species composition, the mammalian species composition of the assemblage. There is no reason to remember the uh, percentages. We will go through them now. It's dominated by pig remains and sheep and goat remains. Combined, they are 90% of the mammalian fauna. And the single most abundant species is the pig by, uh, with almost 40% while sheep and goats combined um, accounted for uh, half the assemblage. Within the sheep and goat category, goat was uh, much more uh, numerous than uh, sheep. And as it is the case for most chronological periods in Cyprus, cattle was quite scarce. There were also beasts of burden present there, uh, equids, which is the family of donkeys and horses and their hybrids. Uh, we can be sure that we have donkey. This tooth, the size and morphology of it is highly suggestive of donkey. Even if it's difficult to tell them apart morphologically, it's easier for some parts of the body than others. And another uh, good evidence that we have at least two types of equids is this phalanx of strikingly different, uh, these two phalanges of strikingly different size. These could have not come both from donkeys or horses. So we have at least two types. If I had to guess, I would say this donkey, the left one is donkey and the right one is horse. And depending on how well they got along, we may have had mules as well. Also some wild animals the, uh, in the family of lagomorphs hares and rabbits, but only hare was positively uh, identified. We, we don't know whether rabbit was also present. Little surprise for the presence of a rodent in a context where included a lot of people and kitchens and rubbish. And this interesting maxilla uh, of a very small dog is a good indication of um, it's usually small dogs are usually taken as evidence of um, high status or a luxury because they don't serve many purposes such as um, shepherd dogs do so people who have at least in the past who had small dogs they had them simply because they could afford to have them besides mammals there were a lot of bird remains and fish uh, the vast majority of bird remains belonged to chicken, and there were also a few remains of pigeon and wood or wood pigeon. It's again very difficult to tell them apart. The fish remains belonged all to large specimens, but this is probably a result of recovery bias because it's very difficult to recover small fish bones. Um, but nevertheless, most of them belonged to catfish. There are two possible species of catfish in, the, in our neighborhood. Clarias gariepinus, which lives in the Near East and Africa, and Clarias angularis, that lives only in Africa. Whichever was, uh, is the case, this fish never lived in Cyprus. So it must have been imported, whether alive or smoked or salted, it's very difficult to tell from its remains. But its importance is that it was brought from um, abroad. Also, there were some marine fish, again of large size, but again, this might be due to recovery bias. Going back to the mammals and the mortality, we see from the pig mortality that um, they liked tender pork as more than half of the pigs were slaughtered within the first year and actually there were also newborn piglets in this 
um, first 12 months. And by the end of the second and third year, very few <coughs> animals uh, survived. So there were very few, a lot of young pigs and very few adults. Situation with sheep and goats. Um, the previous slide and this one are based on epiphyseal fusion uh, aging. And it's a similar, somewhat similar situation with high mortality in the early stages and um, not many adults surviving before, beyond the third and fourth year, but a little bit more than pigs. In terms of chicken, we have both adult and immature animals uh, uh, there. And this very unimpressive bone to you, for me, is the smoking gun for locally produced uh, chicken uh, within the nunnery because that gray substance that fills the cavity of the bone is called medullary bone and is kept on the leg bones of chicken and is essentially the calcium reservoir of chicken of hens to draw, to draw from and construct the eggshell during the egg laying period. <coughs> we also have evidence for both male and female chicken there. As uh, for those of you who have images of village or farm life, you may have noticed that the tibiotarsus, the, the shin bone of uh, male chicken is much taller than the female. So um, we had both males and females. The question of external provision and local production. We have newborn animals and piglets, which is more compatible with on-site production. But we have very few adult pigs and sheep and goat, which might indicate that not all animals were produced there, and some of them may have been brought in just to be fattened a little bit more and slaughtered on-site. The many immature chicken bones, eggshells, and the presence of male and female chicken leave no doubt that chicken were, were produced, uh, exploited within um, or close proximity to the nunnery. On the contrary, the presence of exotics such as the catfish and fish from the Cypriot Sea uh, couldn't have come uh, from anywhere else than further away. In terms of diet, it's difficult uh, the difficulty, the frustrating difficulty is that it's difficult to, to attribute the different components of diet to the different groups that may have resided within the nunnery. Uh, because the nunnery functioned also as a hospital at times, so we don't know who ate what. Um, we know what was eaten, and it was pork, goat, chicken, mutton, and a little bit of beef. Also some wild animals, such as hare, and possibly pigeon. And the fish that is very common in monastic communities in Europe now is confirmed for Cistercians in the East. But independently who ate what, the picture is one of very good quality and diverse diet, although we don't have comparable data in Cyprus. For example, imagine how much more we could have made with this data if we had studied the fauna from a high status site from a rural site, and, and then the comparisons would be, uh, we would be able with comparisons to tell apart who could be eating what. In terms of social status, the consumption of young animals and birds and eggs of those birds suggest respectable social status with the logic of that if you kill a young animal, uh, is because you can't afford to do so, because if you wait for it to grow a little bit more, you could feed, you could feed more, much more people with the same animal. So if you kill a piglet, it's because you can't afford to do so, and you will not starve because you have done so. The large marine fish and catfish from abroad in the dry interior of Cyprus can only be a testament to the nunnery's capacity to uh, acquire highly prized food for, from uh, afar. Expensive, su such expensive food items, such as the catfish and the other fish and young animals, might have been meals with important guests at the nunnery, or simply a reflection of the nunnery's uh, ability to feed well 
its occupants. Also, there is always the possibility that these are donations from local and foreign nobility because many members of this monastic community derived from local and foreign uh, nobility. That was um, the end of the main course, and we are moving on to the uh, concluding part of the um, presentation. And I will talk a little bit about future prospects and opportunities for archaeological research in Cyprus. Something that we, I uh, touched upon in the last case study is that um, the application of archaeology seems to follow um, a pattern of uh, sharp decrease as we uh, progress chronologically. Uh, in the Neolithic and Chalcolithic times uh, periods, there is little problem convincing excavators the, of the importance of collecting and studying um, animal remains. But from around the Bronze Age and first millennium, um, some people break the lines and start uh, not collecting uh, uh, animal remains, probably because there are more lines of evidence available. But um, I don't have to argue, I think among archaeologists, how detrimental it is to consciously throw away such a valuable line of uh, archaeological evidence. And uh, I put a full stop in uh, uh, complaining here, and I will see, put on my positive costume and say that whatever happened, happened. And uh, this has resulted in, um, in nowadays having ample scope for groundbreaking research in those periods, in essentially the second the later half of Cypriot archaeology. Uh, there is scope for research on um, very interesting themes, such as the animal economies in complex societies, such as those we've seen in Cyprus from the Bronze Age onwards. Also, uh, a rather than neglected topic of non-economic interactions between humans and animals. Social zooarchaeology, and with this I refer to the negotiation of social relations with the use of animals through uh, feasting and other interactions between different social classes or between settlements uh, involving animals. There were major environmental changes in Cyprus from the Bronze Age onwards, and it would be interesting to see the responses in terms of animal economy uh, that, uh, to those environmental changes. Uh, under the umbrella of this term, cosmopolitan Cyprus, I refer to the fact that uh, the space of Cyprus for most of the history and prehistory was shared by more than one community, and it would be hugely interesting to analyze um, the relations between communities from the you are what you eat perspective. Um, and also, there is a, a a pressing need in Cypriot archaeology in general to have more work on transitions and uh, projects, more synthetic projects that span more than one period, which will give us uh, an, a more dynamic and a more evolutionary perspective to all these processes that we are currently studying on a site-by-site -site, uh, basis. Um, Cyprus uh, has a brutal climate for the preservation of many molecules, especially DNA, but the first case study I presented shows that there is ample scope for a lot of this analysis to be carried out on faunal remains. Um, it, it simply works, at least isotope simply works, and we just have to get on with securing more funding and doing more work on those, and I am very confident that the results will be, will be fruitful and the positive feedback feedback will bring more research and uh, also become sort of viral. Also, um, it's feasible to run such analysis in the sense that there is uh, more and more funds available for it and also expertise in many places that uh, can do this analysis. Until Cyprus obtains uh, the capacity to have, to carry out the whole chain of uh, analysis, uh, an intermediate strategy could be to sample locally and analyze globally in the sense that we could 
sample here, pre-treat samples here to bring costs down and only use uh, facilities abroad just for the things we currently don't have until uh, one day um, this infrastructure is developed locally. But in the meantime, we would be, we would be progressing in um, Cypriot archaeology and also create the expertise locally to do that um, when the time comes. In terms of creating more interpretative and analytical tools for zooarchaeology, the case study number two I presented, the ethnozooarchaeological part, uh, illustrates the urgency in recording these traditional practices with archaeological questions in mind. And this doesn't only um, concern zooarchaeology. Other subdisciplines of archaeology have a lot to benefit from uh, doing that. I know that colleagues who study ceramics have been doing that as well with positive, uh, very positive results. And unfortunately, um, uh, the clock is ticking <laughs> concerning this because the people who have been doing this are now, uh, they, they, uh, are now uh, very old and um, uh, we have to save the information. In terms of research collections, and I refer to comparative faunal collections, um, there is no, not a single big collection in Cyprus, but there are several collections, smaller collections, the biggest of which is Paul Croft's personal collection. There is one, a small collection here at the Archaeological Research Unit. I am developing a, a, a fast-growing collection in uh, Limassol, and I know of other people who have bits and pieces. So we could very fast, in the future, fuse some of these collections and create a proper big collection. If you talk in private to any zooarchaeologist, they will admit that you cannot do good zooarchaeology without an extensive collection. It's not enough to have one sheep, one goat, and one dog. You have to have 10 or 20 or more of each animal to do a good work. And the reality is that such a collection is not available. So uh, if it becomes, we will raise the standards of zooarchaeological work in Cyprus. The rest of the archaeological tools, um, if we exclude the time-consuming and stinky, stinky business of uh, doing a research uh, reference collection, is, uh, are cheap and mobile, so they are easy to obtain, and there is no excuse for not being well-equipped. And I'm concluding with some opportunities, um, local, regional, and global. Cyprus, despite its small size, generates a large volume of remains, and there is no question that it generates uh, enough volume for sustainable and viable growth of zooarchaeology in Cyprus. Um, and I don't insist in Cyprus because from the nationalist point of view, but uh, for example, there is no collection, as I mentioned before, and if one is created, everybody will benefit. And uh, if work is done locally, we can also set higher standards for all the archaeological work that is carried out in Cyprus. Cyprus's small size, though, can be turned into an advantage for whichever institution um, takes the initiative to establish the archaeology in Cyprus, because it will be in a position to have full coverage in Cyprus and consistency in the study of the faunal remains from now on. Also, the archaeology is not only underdeveloped in Cyprus, but also in our wider neighborhood. And if Cyprus takes the lead on this, it will have an advantage in promoting the archaeology through collaborations with uh, uh, neighboring countries. Also, to conclude with something positive, uh, in my experience in the last few years, projects that involve human-animal interactions are well viewed by funding bodies, uh, both EU and globally especially those that include elements that I referred to in this talk, such as uh, applications, scientific applications in zooarchaeology, um, the urgency of recording fast vanishing information, and also promoting the development of disciplines in areas that currently uh, are underdeveloped in those disciplines. I'd like to thank these institutions for their help in different parts of the research I have shown, and you for your attention. And I would also like to advertise these two master's uh, programs that helped me put bread on my table in Sheffield. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks very much for this uh, excellent lecture. Um, it was the big course meal had everything, and it was <laughs> good to see what has been done, what can be done. And I think the last uh, part uh, with the um, Later material was even more tantalizing, although we usually focus.
focus on the early Neolithic mm. as the most uh, fascinating period. The medieval one is uh, actually quite uh, nice, the, the results that, that you've got. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you'll be happy to take some questions. Hispanica. <laughs> Ξεκινήσω από την πρώτη ερώτηση. Ε, α, απαντήσω στα ελληνικά. Ε, απαντήσω στα ελληνικά. Αγγλικά. Starting from the extinction of uh, Dama Mesopotamica in Cyprus, which is an easier case to answer, um, there is little doubt that uh, the reason was human predation. So Cypriots simply uh, eliminated this, uh, <laughs> ate the, this deer to, to extinction. And unfortunately, it's not the only example. Concerning the. When, when is the. When do um, it remains to be found, but it's it's within the last few hundred years, uh, somewhere uh, maybe in medieval times. Uh, it's it's one big question that, if more research is done in those periods, we might find out. In medieval uh, times, not earlier. Maybe earlier, maybe earlier, but we don't have um, because we ha we don't study medieval, mm. or slightly earlier. We don't know. We cannot be sure. It's it's unknown. Um, we can only be sure until when we have. Um, so, uh, moving on to the late, uh, the, the fauna, the dwarf fauna of Cyprus, of the Pygmy Hippos. Uh, most people are familiar with uh, uh, Alan Simmons' interpretation and David Reese's interpretation of the uh, of Aetokremnos, and this has gone, in my opinion, uh, too far before it was studied a little bit more carefully, and it became established knowledge. I remember reading about it even in the in-flight magazines of Cyprus mm -hmm. Airways that it was certain that they were extinct by people. Having studied a sample of that site of about a thousand bones, and also from my experience in the archaeology so far, I doubt this interpretation because of two reasons. The breakage, so most bones are not broken, and those that are broken don't show signs of being broken when they were fresh. Also, it's impossible, in my opinion, for people to butcher um, so many animals and leave not a single butchery mark on the bones. Um, even the best butcher will uh, make a mistake, especially with stone tools, and leave a mark on the bones. So, strictly speaking, the jury is out. My uh, current advice is that you can see this with uh, doubt until we have a definitive answer. And the other question about the frequency of meat consumption in the past is very difficult to, um, to know the frequency because usually uh, the archaeological assemblages are um, an amalgamation of materials uh, that uh, result from activities of hundreds of years. So is, is very difficult and represent only a fraction of the original number of animals that were 
used at a certain site. So it's impossible to do mathematics and subdivide the animals with the duration of the site and come up with an average um, weight of meat eaten. It, it's, it's simply not possible. But if we take an into account the technology in the past and the lack of uh, means to preserve meat, I suspect that this, this was done on a seasonal basis. Uh, people would follow more the seasonal availability of animals. For example, even in recent uh, periods in Cyprus, people would slaughter the pig around Christmas from November, December, and that then they would have meat for the winter. And then in spring, they would slaughter more lambs and kids, and then they would eat uh, their meat. So it's a seasonal use. <laughs> Whenever they have to manage the herd, get rid of some animals, they would eat meat. But uh, generally, they would never um, kill more than they had to. They would never risk the, the well-being of the herd just to eat meat. In a way, the meat was essentially almost a byproduct of, of the management of the herd. Especially recently, people gave much more priority to milk products than, than the meat. They kept the animals more for milk. So the answer, I think, simple answer would be maybe equally little they would eat in the past if I had to, if I was forced to guess. Unfortunately, this is the <laughs> a thought I'm having all the time, but the problem is this is the difference between ceramics and bones. Yeah. Unfortunately, they don't have a typology no, to separate them. I think uh, we discussed this with the Michalis and others from that side, and uh, we found out that uh, the best approach would be to keep it as a single sample. Uh, because even if there are some uh, differentiations in, uh, for example, I have the depths that the bones were found, but if, we, if I subdivided the samples too much, then they would become meaningless. So for statistical reasons, often in zooarchaeology, we choose to give up resolution and uh, gain statistical uh, strength in order to say less things, less specific things, but more reliably. Ethnographic work uh, didn't include equids, um, but uh, in the past uh, I was uh, interested in this in an amateur <laughs> way. Uh, I was even member of the uh, donkeys actuary and adopted a donkey and all that. And unfortunately, uh, we all know that uh, the treatment was very brutal in the past. Oftentimes they were pushed off cliffs or just abandoned, and that's actually the the origin of the donkey, the feral donkey herds that you find in Carpasia, these are from donkeys that were released and they were young enough to reproduce. Mm -hmm. But they were there already when you lived. Very interesting, but probably people uh, did the same practice from the past. Uh, it's not a recent phenomenon. Uh, is th are there references to yes, it? There are recent references Very interesting.
my best to, to integrate my findings with other lines of evidence. Uh, many projects cannot afford to fund this, but uh, I think uh, it's a matter, it's correct, it's the right thing to do to try to inter interact as much as possible, at least if not directly, or uh, if the project doesn't involve a process of integration of all lines of evidence, the best we can do is to either get in touch, as I, I do, or at least read the findings of others. It has been the case, uh, I have a, uh, I wanted to complain about that as well, but uh, many times uh, I submitted a, a chapter in a monograph uh, or, or uh, um, in a book, and they don't even think of sending you the rest of the chapters in time so you can uh, integrate the results. Usually I understand that it's pressures of time and money, but we should all make the best effort possible to improve integration. Actually, uh, on integration, since you touched on this, um, ethno-archaeology um, also is very, um, is very beneficial in the sense of uh, in improving integration in archaeology because uh, if we study only the archaeological remains of animals, we, we are more prone to studying them in isolation only as animal bones. But when you do ethnoarchaeology as well, you see a living system, you see the interconnectedness between plants and animals, or, or animals and the environment, and in this sense, it also improves integration. Uh, yes, we have I think, uh, first of all, uh, each isotope is a world on its own, simply because they are affected by completely different uh, processes. Uh, in a way, the only common thing of uh, stronti between strontium isotopes and oxygen isotopes is the fact that they are called isotopes. Um, so we should see each one and its problems individually. Uh, the diet, I suspect, that is a particularly difficult one because there are many... Uh, unknown factors. Uh, for example, we don't know parts of the sequence. We have to uh, start from the plants, for example, and then move on on the trophic chain uh, to leave a uh, little uh, scope for uh, areas that we have no control of. Uh, now, it's early days as well of isotopes. At some point, we will discover that some of the research we have done was entirely wrong, and we would have to reconsider this is also possible. But uh, we should always double check through ethnoarchaeology as well. Because um, many times in archaeology, especially in archaeology, I read about interpretations that um, show that people, most of us come from um, urban areas. We don't have knowledge of what it means to keep pigs or sheep or goat. And that resulted in some of the interpretations being out of touch with reality. I have seen interpretations about pigs that made me thought, have you ever seen a pig? <laughs> or <laughs> really? So it's another reason why we should try to uh, be as informed as possible. We don't have to get out in the fields and raise pigs, but we can read about it. Syndrome. So you have your appendix, I have my appendix, and that's it. Or 
take your advice thinking. sorry mm -hmm. i'll take your advice I, I i agree with you we should spearhead the effort and i think that if we do that and uh, we reach a certain critical mass of produced results i think then it becomes kind of uh, people will uh, start even feeling uh, ashamed or even in the sense of competitiveness <coughs> they will feel like why my excavation will not have uh, animal remains we can exploit also the vanity <laughs> of humans well, as well. I, I think your, your, um, I mean, these results you show today show very well the things that somebody can <coughs> get. In a way, it can, uh, now you know, so there is little excuse of not doing yeah. it.